Okay, well, uh, 2021 season um, was a, perhaps a little different from um, any others. We had a few uh, little difficulties to overcome. Um, but one of the ways that it was slightly different was that uh, on January the 1st, we managed to make a trip, a day trip out to the calf um, to have a quick look round, check that everything was still standing that should be, um, but also to have a look at some of the birds that were um, around the calf. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do was visit um, some caves which are situated below the, the lighthouses. And we've noticed over recent years that these caves are very important for purple sandpipers. Um, this map shows the UK um, sort of wintering population of, of uh, purple sandpipers, or the British Isles population, and you can see that the Isle of Man's got a nice blue uh, blob at the the bottom end there, which uh, is a number of sites around the calf, uh, around the, the south of the island, but principally the calf. We've we've recently had um, a count of 101 purple sandpipers there, and another one uh, on on January the first, where we had I think 51. So, if we look at the um, sort of figures, um, it's an amber listed species, as in the uh, Birds of Conservation Concern that was pre uh, recently published by Manx BirdLife, and if you look at the, the, the figures, you know, 100 birds puts us well between uh, the All-Ireland threshold and, and the uh, Great Britain threshold, so really quite an important population uh, within a geographical range. Um, unfortunately, we didn't uh, then be able to get out to the calf again until April the 21st, uh, and at that time uh, we made our way out to, to start the actual season. Um, I was joined uh, by a number of others, so Krista Worth, who is uh, sort of behind me on the boat. Um, she was a volunteer that came out and spent a couple of months with us. Um, Krista actually won one of the MWT's um, Outstanding Volunteer Awards recently, uh, and very well deserved for the, the hard work that she's put in uh, over last season and, and this season. Um, Rob Fisher in the middle there, he was our assistant bird warden for the year. Rob had also been with us in 2020, so it was great having him back out there with, with his knowledge and experience of the place. Uh, and then on the right, uh, Daniel Woolard, who has been the estate warden for the, the past four years. Uh, Daniel's actually moving on now, so he won't be uh, joining us this next season, um, but moving on to Pastures New in Essex. And then Molly Kirk uh, joined us uh, as assistant warden as well. So arriving in sort of late April, um, bird migration was already in sort of full swing. Um, and you can see here a, a number of different warblers uh, that were starting to, or, or were already moving through uh, the calf. Um, in the top left there, you've got uh, a white throat. Um, so white throats starting to move through in, in April. And we get quite a reasonable number of white throats through the calf. Um, in the bottom left there, we've got a grasshopper warbler. Um, now, this is a species which has occurred previously in reasonable numbers, never very common, but um, it's now considerably scarcer than it was. So this was the only grasshopper warbler that we had um, during spring 2021. Um, in the middle there, we've got a reed warbler. Um, over recent years, we've had uh, a number of April records of, of reed warblers, and I'll, I'll come on to talk about those um, in a little bit more detail later on. And then on the right, we have a pair of black caps, uh, a species which has increased quite considerably in, in the numbers uh, that, that pass through the calf uh, in, in recent years. Um, and I'm going to talk about them a, a, a little bit later as well. So back to the reed warbler. So reed warblers uh, are a species which didn't normally breed on, on the Isle of Man, so they're very much a passage bird. Um, they were first found or first recorded on the calf um, in not until 1970, so um, a fairly recent uh, sort of species to, to start to turn up. Um, if we look at the sort of comparison graph there, um, you can see that on the blue line at the bottom, there are actually very few records in the first sort of 25 years uh, of the bird observatory. Um, and if you actually look at the sort of um, where they occur in, in, in sort of months, um, the autumn period is actually sort of twice as likely as, as it would be in, in spring. However, if we look at the last 25 years, 
the, the, the actual frequency of, of reed warblers turning up uh, has changed. So we now have twice as many birds in spring and, and many more birds in spring um, than we do uh, in <coughs> autumn. So it's turning up with much greater frequency. Um, that's illustrated also in this second graph. You can see that in the last five years, we've actually recorded three times more reed warblers than uh, has been recorded in any previous sort of five-year block. So why is that happening? So if we look at the uh, breeding bird survey map, so these are from uh, the British Trust Ornithology who carry out <coughs> breeding bird surveys across the, the British Isles. Um, and if you look at the um, sort of blocked pink area, you'll see that uh, that's the area where reed warblers were recorded in the previous sort of two breeding surveys that the BTO did. Um, but you can see that around the north, uh, northwest of England, um, in Northern Ireland and in Southern Ireland to some degree, uh, and also in Southern Scotland, that there's been gains in the breeding population. So that the triangles I indicate that. Um, and so what we're probably seeing is the birds passing through the calf are these new breeders that are uh, coming into these uh, areas as the species um, is sort of moving north within the country. So this is probably a, a result of sort of climate change in some way. So if we move on to the black caps that I mentioned earlier, um, you can see from the graph here that the, uh, f the, the sort of timings of black cap migration has changed quite considerably. So if you'd visited the calf in 1959, um, you wouldn't have seen a black cap on the calf until early May. If you look at the graph going down, if you go to the calf now, we would expect to see black caps first arriving at the end of March. So there's been a, a, almost a five-week uh, change in the, their migration pattern. So they've been getting uh, almost a week every decade earlier uh, in their migration. So again, why, why is this happening? Um, there's been a number of studies done on, on black caps. And one of the things that they found is that black caps now winter in the UK much more regularly than they ever did before. And through ringing studies, we found that these black caps uh, that are wintering in the UK um, are breeding uh, in sort of Eastern uh, Europe, so over towards Germany, and then coming over to winter in uh, the, uh, the British Isles. Um, and sort of further studies have actually found that the, the species has sort of diverged so that we've got one part of the population, those that are in uh, Eastern Europe, which then come sort of southeast into <coughs> the British Isles for the winter. And then we've got uh, a population in Western Europe, which then goes southwest into Spain, Portugal, and Northern Africa for the winter. Um, and the reason that birds are doing that is that they're, they're finding that if they don't travel quite so far south, they can actually get back to their breeding grounds much quicker. So these birds are able to get back to their breeding grounds about 10 to 15 days earlier than the, those birds that have gone further south. So there's definitely a, an ev evolutionary change happening. And again, probably some result of, of sort of climate change. And again, if we look at the, the breeding bird survey maps that the BTO produce, you can see that the um, it, the range expansion that, that black cap's gone. So it's a much more common species nowadays um, as a breeding bird on the island and across areas like Ireland and Scotland than it, than it ever was before. Now towards the um, <coughs> end of April, we managed to make one of our first trips uh, out to Kitterland. So we're very fortunate to have um, uh, uh, some very good boatmen. So Caroline and, and Phil Roriston who um, charter the, or have the, the charter boat Vagabond, they managed to uh, drop us off on uh, the Kitterland, which isn't always that easy. Uh, it takes a little bit of uh, skillful <coughs> negotiating the tides and, and the various rocks that are there. Um, but once they've got us ashore, we can then go about uh, the, the work that we need to do there, which is looking at the, the long tail um, bait points that we have. So we have a series of, of, of bait tubes which are um, baited with non-toxic wax blocks, uh, and the idea is that if there is a long tail there, they'll come along, chew on that, and then we'll be able to see the, the teeth marks and we'll know that there's a long tail there. Thankfully, for the last two years, we've not found uh, any evidence of them there. And we also have a camera trap, which also 
records what's going on during the winter. So, um, you know, that's a good good thing that we're not not seeing any long tails there. Um, one thing that we did found, find there, which is a little bit unusual, uh, was this grey lag goose. Um, uh, the bird was actually there for quite a long time. There was a lot of evidence of, of it having been on, the, on Kitalan for a long time um, and uh, regular footage of it on the camera trap. Uh, one of the other tasks that we had uh, to do in the sort of early part of the year was to um, put up or erect a new hide um, at the, the mill pond. So the old hide that you can see uh, in the sort of top left-hand corner um, had become rather dilapidated, um, and it was also not quite in the right place. So you had to access it from the front, which meant you, you flushed everything away from the mill pond before you actually got into it. So um, we've now built this new hide, um, the other side of the wall, so that you can access it uh, without necessarily flushing everything off first. Um, this was funded by a talk <coughs> that uh, myself and a previous warden uh, Nathan Wilkie did um, at the Sound a couple of years ago. So really nice to see this uh, eventually up and in place. Um, and it provides us with not only the ability to sort of watch what's happening at the, uh, the, the mill pond, but also to help with uh, when we're ringing there, that we can actually use that um, as a base to, to ring out of. Now, during the sort of spring time on the calf, we wanted to run uh, a number of different events. Um, so we had uh, a dry stone walling event, so you can see a team of people there. We had two, two events over the, the course of the, the, of the spring. Um, they were really well attended and, and they worked really well in helping us to be able to um, build and repair a lot of the dry stone walls um, around the calf. And, and the dry stone walls are a very important feature of the calf. Um, in the bottom left there, you can see Dan and Molly having a, a smashing time in South <laughs> Harbour, um, literally smashing up the rocks that uh, had been washed down or washed into there through the, the winter. So one of the problems there was that the boats were having difficulty getting in at certain tides, uh, so we needed to, to remove those, those rocks. So um, yeah, th there's all sorts of different tasks that, that we need to complete during the time that we're there. Um, the sort of bottom right... Uh, picture, the small picture, shows a, a, a group of people who were over to help us with or to look at uh, Manx Shearwaters and, and they helped with a variety of different things or took part in a variety of things that we did during the, the day. Um, here they're actually um, holding some hooded crows that we, we would have been ringing. Um, and then again Dan, Molly and Krista, um, they've been um, working on the track repairs that need doing around the island. Um, I believe they were trying to sort of pretend to be a band, but I haven't really come up with a, <laughs> a name as yet for them. Um, we were very lucky and very fortunate to receive some funding uh, last year from the Currex Wildlife Park, um, and that enabled us to buy a, a thermal imaging camera. This is a, an excellent piece of kit which has really made a huge difference to the work that we can do and, and to us being able to understand what's happening uh, particularly at night, so it allows us to be able to see everything that's going on at night. Um, in the sort of centre there, you can actually see a picture of uh, a Manx shearwater, so that's what they look like uh, in, the, in the thermal camera. Um, and the picture at the top left uh, shows the sort of team of people that were out. They all thought it would be a great idea to stand there and um, <laughs> look very nice on, on, on the picture that's taken with the, the thermal camera. Um, and if you look closely, you'll actually see there is a Manx Shearwater just in front of them, <laughs> which you wouldn't know was there otherwise. So. so this is what the sort of view that we get from the, the camera, so we can actually see um, the birds that are flying around, whereas before, the only way we would have known that they were there was hearing this call. So typically our, our way of, of monitoring Manx Shearwaters before we had the thermal camera was to actually do this in uh, daytime. The problem being that Manx Shearwaters are completely nocturnal, so we can't see them during the day. Um, but one of the things that we can do is to play that call back to them. So we play this down the burrow, um, and then the birds uh, will hopefully then respond, and then we know that <coughs> that burrow is occupied by a, a Manx Shearwater pair. 
Uh, the picture on the left just shows somebody uh, sort of working through the, the process. So we have a series of, of burrows that are marked by uh, numbered pegs, and then we visit those each day for a, a set period, uh, play the recording, and then uh, we record whether we've had a response, whether that's a male or a female or both. Uh, and then from that, we can, I say, work out what sort of occupancy we've got. Um, one of the sort of different things that we did this year was to look at the actual colonies that we've got and, and map those colonies. Uh, so you can see on the map here the red areas. So these are the actual sort of colony boundaries uh, that we have. And we have eight colonies. Uh, we had only seven up to last year. But again, the thermal imaging camera m enabled us to find uh, a colony just up the top by the lighthouses here, which is on a, a very precipitous piece of, of rock where we wouldn't normally want to go and climb around, particularly not at night. But with the camera, we could actually sit at the top of the cliff and watch birds landing and going into their burrows. So we, we now know that we have a, another colony. Um, so what we did was to actually look at all of those different colonies, work out the area of those colonies. Uh, and then as part of our survey, um, we also then look at um, the number of burrows that there are in those colonies. So one of the tasks we do is we set um, about five or six people the task of crawling through all the bracken and finding each burrow there is and playing a tape down it. Uh, and we do that within the, the sort of two-week period that we are operating. We do that on one day. So we cover the whole colony uh, in one day. Uh, and that gives us, or that tells us how many burrows we have within that area. Having worked out how many burrows we have, we can then sort of extrapolate that up using um, the, the information that we now have uh, from the colony boundaries. So as I said, you know, the problem with bank shorters is they are nocturnal. So doing this all during the day is all well and good, but what we're now finding is that, uh, or further research has now found that they don't actually respond that often. So if you play a call down a burrow, it may respond, but quite likely it won't. So we're probably underestimating our population quite significantly. Um, the Isle of May recently trialled um, using a sniffer dog to actually work out whether there was birds in a burrow, and they actually found that, that worked really well. So that might be something we have to think about um, trying in the future. Um, but if you look at the, the graph at the bottom, um, this just shows you the sort of various uh, sort of population levels that we think we sort of might be getting. So the, the bottom um, colony count, so that is where we've gone through and counted the colony in one day, and then we work out from the responses that we got. So that's just a, a snapshot, one day view of the thing. So we would expect that to be the sort of lowest. And then we've got a 10 day and a 14 day survey. And they both come out at reasonably similar. So we probably, you know, we, we're saying that, yes, that's all, that's all working fine. Um, but what we now know, uh, and from the work that we, or the surveys that we've done, is that if you continue operating this process for 14 days, you actually get a cumulative total of burrows. So that cumulative rises from about a 20 to 25% response on an individual day to about a 52% response rate over the course of those 14 days. So if we use that a cumulative um, response rate, it then takes our uh, population up to a much higher level. So we're now looking that we could potentially have somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 pairs uh, of Manx shearwaters. And given the res uh, research that's recently done on the Isle of May, that would actually seem to be a much more realistic figure. So that's a really positive thing. So. Before Lara gets too worried about the fact that we're abseiling <laughs> down the cliffs to, to get to things, this isn't actually very high. It's just having the rope for safety. Uh, so this is Rob at a hooded crow's nest. Um, so one of the things that we do um, is to monitor the, the bird nests that we have uh, at the various locations around the calf. Uh, and you can see that from the list, it's a fairly sort of diverse uh, sort of range of species. Um, but it's also a sort of range of species that perhaps don't get recorded normally. So, um, it, it, you know, it, we have a, a unique sort of uh, combination of species on the calf. So it's really useful data to be able to feed into uh, a national data set. So certainly, you know, species like peregrine, eiders, um, 
buzzard, yeah, they're all, all good species to be able to, to record. Um, one of the other species on that list is the shag. So we have a, a reasonably healthy, but uh, in the past, a, a or not in the past, in, in the present, a declining um, population of shags. So perhaps up to 75% uh, they've declined uh, since the sort of uh, mid-80s. So one of the things that we want to try and find out is why is that happening? Um, so you, if you look very closely, you might just, I don't think you can, but there, are, there is actually a red ring on the leg of that bird. So we, we put a, a BTO metal ring, and we also put a, a Darvik ring, which has a, a colour and a code on it. And that means that we can identify that bird in the field. Uh, so we can identify it individually. Uh, so one of the things that we then do is to go back to those breeding areas and try to see those birds once they've fledged the nest. And that will then um, start to give us an idea of a productivity level so that we can start to understand, is the population decline because they're not producing enough young? Um, or is it because there isn't uh, sufficient adult survival? So it's looking at those different things, trying to work out uh, what the causes are. And then once we know the cause, we can then try and work out uh, what we can do about that, pro that uh, decline and hopefully reverse it. Um, this is Molly looking very chuffed with uh, having caught a, an Ida. Um, Idas uh, are a relatively new breeding species for the calf. They first bred in 1992 um, and their numbers have risen quite rapidly. So this would be one of the species I would love to be able to do some further research work on. Um, we don't know where they came from. So before 1990 they were a rarity on the calf um, but obviously one or two pairs decided that they liked the calf uh, and their numbers have grown rapidly. So we're now looking uh, at, at probably at least 70 pairs on the calf. And then also during the summer, we spend a lot of our time monitoring the, the gulls and the other seabirds uh, that are there. Uh, one of the things that we do with the gulls is also to put uh, a, a colouring on them. So you can see uh, a little bit better on here. You can see the, the, the great black back gull there with uh, its red darvik on. Uh, so that enables the, these gulls to, to fly off and go and visit other places and we get other bird watchers that see the, the bird with the ring on, they read the number and then they send that in to the BTO and they then notify us. So we then start to learn what these birds do why, and then we can start to ask, well, why do they do these sort of things? Um, so this is an important process to go through so that we can understand you know, why there's certain effects on, on the populations. <coughs> If we look at the herring gull um, colouring that we've done, um, you can see there we've got red dots and blue dots. Um, and the blue dots show the more recent recoveries, so those that have occurred since 1991. And the red dots are pre-1990. So clearly in the 1990s and, and, and earlier, herring gulls did something different. They went to Merseyside. But for some reason, they've now decided that Ireland is better. So again, you know, why, why is that happening? It might have been that there was a landfill or something in Merseyside that they thought, yeah, this is a good place to go. So we then got reports there. But if that's closed, they now have moved somewhere else. And then I mentioned uh, the buzzard. So the buzzard was a, a bit of a nice one for us this year. Um, we'd actually predicted that they might breed on the calf the, the year before uh, and sure enough we had uh, a pair that were breeding on the calf. Unfortunately they weren't successful, uh, they built a nest, they were a bit territorial around the nest for a, a few weeks but they don't, we don't think they actually laid any eggs so um, yeah, probably an immature pair and, and hopefully next year they'll, they'll uh, do something more. Um, but again it's a species which was a rarity on the calf not so long ago. Um, during October this year we had uh, the amazing sight uh, if you can just make out they're not just specks on the, <laughs> the screen but they are buzzards and we had a flock of 20 buzzards thermaling uh, above the observatory um, a, a sight I never really ever expected to see on the calf maybe three or four but not 20 um, we're also able to catch one of the buzzards um, so this is a juvenile one that we caught so this was uh, the first buzzard uh, ever ringed on the calf as well. So, so that's all the sort of work, or some of the work that we're doing during uh, the, the summer months. 
Um, what we find on the calf, though, is that spring merges into summer, and then summer very much merges into autumn, and spring prob uh, sorry, summer probably only lasts about a week on the calf. Um, but this is one of the sort of late spring migrants, so we've got uh, a cuckoo here. Um, this is a subalpine warbler. Um, it's a Mediterranean species which uh, occurs on the calf reasonably regularly. I would say the calf probably is one of the best places in the British Isles uh, to, to see this species. Not that you can really guarantee when it will turn up, but one, one does normally most years. Um, this bird on the left is a, 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 a woodchat shrike, uh, an absolute cracking adult male, uh, which turned up at the beginning of June. Um, this was only the fifth calf record and uh, the first one for 27 years, so it was uh, a little bit unexpected, but a very nice surprise. Uh, and then around the same period, we also got this pied flycatcher. Um, pied flycatchers, a bit like I said with grasshopper warblers, used to be relatively um, frequent as a, as a species to be seen on the calf, but their numbers have decreased, and, and particularly spring birds uh, are quite rare, so it was, it was nice to get one of those uh, as well. So as I say, we only have a very short period of summer, but one of the things that we uh, are able to do during the summer is to catch storm petrels. So storm petrels are um, a very, very small uh, bird that uh, spends all of its life pretty much at sea, only comes ashore to breed. Um, as yet, we don't, aren't sure that they breed on the calf. It's been one of the things that we would love to be able to prove whether it actually breeds or not. But they're certainly present around the calf sort of during June uh, and July time. Um, Early autumn on the calf, say, comes quite quickly. Um, and this is a, a juvenile blue tit um, that was caught on the 19th of July last year. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what, what's so special about a blue tit? So you see them in your gardens every day. Uh, but actually on the calf, they're quite rare, particularly in July. This was only the second July record in the history uh, of the, the observatory. And what was even more astounding was that record was on the 19th of July 1971 and this was the 9th of July so exactly 50 years later to the day this second record turned up and that's one of the things that amazes me uh, about birds. Another species which is fairly common in your gardens you'll see house sparrows but again we get quite excited when there's a house sparrow <laughs> knocking around the observatory and then something that you won't see in your garden uh, this is a black-tailed godwit, the 17th calf record, turned up on the mill pond uh, during August. Um, we'd spent a lot of time last year uh, managing the mill pond, digging out all the silt that builds up there, clearing out all the, the vegetation, horsetail that grows, uh, and this was uh, a reward for that. It was, it was really nice to be able to see uh, the sort of fruits of our labour, actually see it attracting birds to, to the habitat that we'd created. And then we really got into autumn. So this is uh, a thrush nightingale, the second Manx record. I am actually the only person in the Isle of Man to have seen both thrush nightingales on the Isle of Man. So uh, I caught one in um, May 1989, uh, and then this one this year. So if you just look at the, the map, the, the sort of um, orangey yeah, area at the top shows you the sort of breeding range. So the species sort of breeds all the way across from sort of Scandinavia right across sort of Europe into, into Russia. And then it uh, winters down in, in East Africa, sort of Kenya, down to sort of Zimbabwe. Uh, as a species, it's, um, I think the, the, the record we had in 1989 was one of the, was, was actually the furthest west British record at the time. Uh, there's been a few others now in Ireland, so we, we can't hold that record any longer. But. Uh, and then about a week later, uh, we caught this barred warbler, um, first one for, for nine years. Um, and this was, or this has always been a bit of a, uh, my most wanted bird on the calf. Uh, it just eluded me, and I, I really wanted to see one, so it was really nice to, to sort of get that one out of the way. Um, as you can see from the graph, it was a relatively frequent uh, sort of vagrant, so you know it would turn up in, in small numbers, um, perhaps not every year, but probably every other year, uh, and did so for, for quite some time at the early part of the, 
observatory's uh, history. But in the last 20 years, there's only been two records. So it's really declined uh, as a species occurring on the calf. Um, you can see on, on this bird, the uh, tail feathers here have got... Um, look out to one user. Uh, this bar running across. So this is one of the things that tells us that this is uh, a juvenile bird. Uh, so a bird born this year. Um, and uh, that's what we know as a, a fault bar, which occurs when the bird's in the nest and it's growing its feathers. There's a period of time where the adults can't feed the bird, maybe because there's been a, a thunderstorm or, or something which prevents them from feeding. Um, and the birds stop growing. And then when the uh, food starts to be brought into the nest again by the adults, they start growing. And depending on how long that gap is, it can create these faults in their feathers. Um, and they can actually be strong enough as a fault to make the feather break off. And that's, that's actually quite a strong one. So potentially that could happen with that bird. <coughs> We'd only really just got over the excitement of catching a <laughs> barred warbler um, when I was just finishing in one of the, the net rounds that we do and um, one of the volunteers that was staying with us, uh, a girl called Anna, came up to me and said, handed me a bird bag and said, I've caught a bird and I don't know what it is. So I took it inside, had a quick look. I then rang Neil and said, I think I've got a paddy field warbler here. Uh, and showed him it on video, and he said, yeah, I think that's what you've got there. So uh, we were rather excited at this point because it was a new species for the Isle of Man. So paddy field, war oops, I'm going wrong way. Uh, paddy field warblers should not be on the Isle of Man, really. Um, it's a very rare vagrant to the UK. Probably one or two records occur on an annual basis. Um, and most of those records occur on the sort of eastern coast of, of Great Britain, um, sort of anywhere down from sort of Fair Isle to, to Flamborough. Um, so it, it's not something that we would have expected in uh, the west. Um, so it wasn't really on our radar as something that we would likely uh, find in a net, but very nice to do so. Uh, as you can see, the, the breeding range um, extends across the sort of Black Sea coast, uh, all the way across the steppes of Russia, uh, into Mongolia and China, uh, and the bird winters down in, in, in India, so well out of the way on the Isle of Man. And then just to round off uh, what was a very exciting week, uh, we then caught a common rose finch, um, a very boring, drab-looking bird uh, by, by many standards, but still interesting enough to us. 32nd um, record and, and, and the first one since uh, 2016. So. It's a species which breeds sort of very commonly across the whole of Europe um, and down into Asia. Now, one of the things I wanted to try and get or sort of portray to you, it, you know, finding rarities is an exciting thing, but it's not really the be-all and end-all of it. And one of the things that we're there to do is to record migration as it happens. Um, but how do I show you migration happening? Um, this is a photograph of a bird flying over the calf. And that's really the view that we often get of a bird. So we're identifying the bird by its call or by its flight pattern rather than actually seeing the colours that are on the bird. Um, but just to show you a few sort of days and a few sort of species ranges that, that we get. So here um, on the 10th of October, we've got a, a good number of migrant birds of prey moving through the, the island. Um, we've got some corvids, jackdaws and, and rooks coming through, which again, are species you probably are very familiar with in your gardens and don't necessarily see them uh, as migrants. Uh, same with the, the, the tits, coal tit, blue tit, great tit. You know, they're they're a, a migrant bird to us. Uh, and then we've got the skylark passage starting uh, in early October, uh, along with a good number of meadow pipits and pied wagtails. So, we're stood there counting these birds as they're going over, um, which for me is one of the most exciting parts of, of the year, actually seeing this migration taking place. Uh, a couple of days later, um, skylarks really ramped up, so we've not got over 500 skylarks through uh, in the morning. Got some starlings starting to, to move through, uh, and we've got the first red wings um, of the year coming through. You can see the meadow pipit starting to, to tail off. So we, we normally get this sort of rolling process where one species uh, comes through in big numbers and that gradually tails off and another one then takes over. 
so here we can see uh, on by the end of October, we've now got really big numbers of starlings and red wings. Um, 30th of October was a really special day. Um, the red wings arrived literally just after dawn, so probably 10, 15 minutes after it was light. There weren't any birds around uh, at the beginning of, of, of dawn, but literally we saw them dropping out of the sky, and they just, clouds of hundreds of birds just fell out of the sky and into the bushes around the bird observatory. So, you know, five and a half thousand um, from just those two species. 2nd of November, Great Northern Diver again, not a species you would expect, but we saw those on, on both days flying over the bird observatory. Um, Hooper swans, wood pigeons now really uh, moved up into the sort of top numbers, so 236 of those, uh, and jackdaws, 742. Um, you can see the red wings are starting to sort of tail off a little bit, as are the starlings, but then we've got sparrows coming in, uh, and we've also got reasonable numbers of chaffinches and bramblings, we had a really good year for bramblings this year, uh, sort of a northern chaffinch, which uh, we don't always see uh, numbers of. And then the last list there, again, see the stock dove uh, coming in, which is a, a rarity on the calf. Um, again, good numbers of, of wood pigeons, um, but chaffinch is also still coming through uh, in big numbers. So even in those sort of last few days that we're on the calf, we've got a lot of birds moving through. And then when we thought that it really couldn't get any better, um, we found this red flank blue tail in the net. Um, so this was the first calf record, the second Manx record, one having been found at the point of error a couple of years ago. Um, this is a, a bird which, for many bird watchers, I think was a sort of a, a dream I would ever find one of these. Um, they've become a lot more, I wouldn't say common, but more regular um, as a species uh, in, in the last sort of particularly the last decade. Um, so as you can see from the, the map, um, they breed all the way across uh, through the sort of Russia and northeast of Europe. Um, but they've now started to move into Finland. Uh, and there's now a population that are breeding uh, probably about five or six hundred pairs in Finland. And we think that our birds may well be from that population. Um, certainly since that has happened, they've become more regular as a vagrant in the UK. Um, those are great, those sort of things happen when it's nice calm days, which obviously on the calf don't always happen uh, very frequently, um, but when they do, they're great. But when they don't, then we turn our attention to the sea. So Cow Harbour is a great place to, to go and watch uh, birds moving past when it's stormy. Uh, so you can see there a range of um, seabirds that we, that we saw during that, that day. So I think we, we did a, a three and a half hour sea watch. Um, I suppose Kitty Wake 525. The, the goals perhaps were the, the standout sort of group here. Um, 33 lesser blackbacks in uh, early November is really a very, very high count. Um, lesser blackbacks should be in Portugal at this time of year, not flying past the Calf of Man. So uh, I'm wondering why there were so many there. And then. Um, we also sea watch on the other side of the island, on the west side at Colbury sometimes. Um, this was just an hour's sea watch, and we had nearly 5,000 kitty wakes go past in just that one hour. So we can get some really big numbers of birds moving through, given the right weather conditions that, that force the birds past the calf in those big numbers. Now, just to mention a few of the sort of groups and, and things that, that happened on the calf um, during the year. Um, top left and middle uh, bottom, uh, there's a group of people um, that were involved in the sort of tail end of the season. So um, we had the two SEAL volunteers, which I'm sure Laura, Lara is going to, to mention uh, shortly. Um, so Lauren Stokes and Mari Young, who came out uh, for a couple of months to monitor uh, the grey seals. Um, it's always a real pleasure when you've been on the calf for seven or eight months to have new faces come out there and, and join and make a new dynamic in, in the place. Um, the top middle, um, we're all holding stamps uh, that were part of a, um, a new stamp collection which uh, Isle of Man Post Office did for the, the seven, 70th anniversary of Manx National Heritage owning uh, the Calf of Man. Uh, and then bottom left 
uh, was the governor's visit. The governor's actually been out a couple of times um, to stay on the calf. Uh, and then top right uh, is Anna and Rob. Uh, I think they were both ringing species that they'd never ringed before, hence their, their deep concentration uh, on what they were doing. And then the bottom right is my favourite photograph of, of the year. Um, it shows Krista in her usual smiley self, always happy with whatever she was doing. Um, but it shows Molly with a deep <laughs> scowl on her face. Uh, unfortunately, during the summer, we had, uh, our main vehicle, the Polaris, broke down and we had to make do with the tractor for two and a half months. Um, Travelling along in the back of the trailer on on the tractor is extremely bouncy and very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, and I think that was Molly's face saying, I really do not want to go for another ride in the tractor. <laughs> and I'll end on this fantastic photograph that Rob Fisher took um, just towards the end of the season, which shows uh, a very unique view of the calf. So this is looking from um, near to uh, South Harbour, an area called Rarick, uh, and it's looking back at the calf. And, and you, know, you can see uh, we've got Peru on the, the right there, and you can see all the way across to the bird observatory in the farmhouse um, in the middle, and then round to the lighthouses, and then to the stack and chickens rock. I've never seen a photograph quite mm -hmm. like that before, so yeah, a, a fantastic view to a fantastic island. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so Aaron's done the boring bit. I get to do the fun <laughs> bit now. We always have arguments about seals being boring. So um, one thing I would say... Um, I haven't got the most up-to-date information. Obviously, the SEAL volunteers um, have only just come off, so they're still pulling together um, all of the information for me. So a lot of what I've got to talk about is, is linked with a lot of last year, but there is still some updates. So we have two um, SEAL species that come and visit the calf. We have uh, the Atlantic Grey Seals, and we also have the Common Seals. And they're not as common as, as people think. We probably only see a very small number on the island, maybe making up 5% of our population. We do tend to see them around the calf and the sound and areas like that, and also Ramsey. Um, quite often they're seen sort of Ramsey and Mackled way. I think a few years ago, two of them decided to haul up in, in the harbour on that, that um, sandy bank by the, the, the swing bridge there. So, um, but our... Our predominant species is our Atlantic grey seals here, and that's what we tend to focus our time monitoring on the calf because that's what we tend to see most. Um, and in terms of breeding and pupping, the common seals tend to have their pups earlier, and also they tend to predominantly do it at sea. The pups are practically born in the water and they're able to swim very quickly. So monitoring numbers and pups is very, very difficult, whereas the greys obviously haul up um, and, and have their pups around our coast. So the SEAL surveys have been ongoing since 2009 and we've had different volunteers coming out through the years to come and help. Um, it originally started um, with just volunteers coming for a week or two weeks at a time and then we'd rotate and we would do about a six week period. Um, but as time has gone on, and Aaron has alluded to this with the birds, in terms of them arriving earlier, our seals have done the same as well. So our survey period is extended to about an eight week period now and we try and come out a little bit earlier. But I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. But this is Smuggler's um, cave here. And Aaron mentioned the thermal imaging camera and how brilliant it's been for helping to survey um, at night time for the Manx Shearwaters and the petrels. Well, another side of that is it's actually been really, really helpful for looking for seal pups in this cave system. It's very dark, it goes back a long way and you can't really see anything. And there's an awful lot of rocks that look like seal pups. So um, I'm very pleased to say it's really helped us um, identify whether what we're looking at is a rock or a seal or, or a pup or whatever. So it's been really, really helpful to help with the seal surveys as much as um, the bird work as well. So really, really helpful. So this graph here 
Um, we monitor various aspects of the seal population on the calf, the predominance being um, the seal pups and their survivability, their births and, and, and their, their mortalities as well. So this graph here shows from 2009 up to last year um, and we're sort of plateauing at 60 plus. This year we had 62, so it's on a par with all of the other years as well. So nice to see we have this sort of leveling off of a population. And it's likely that this is partly linked to the fact that there's only so much capacity on the calf. Uh, there's only so many suitable beaches for the, the pups to be born. Um, a lot of them are quite cliffy, rocky edges and areas like that that aren't really suitable, particularly when it gets stormy. Uh, so we've only got a few areas that are suitable and they don't like to get too close with each other. The mums get very protective of their pups, so they like to have a bit of space. But it's, it's lovely to see we've got this nice sort of levelling out of 60 plus. Obviously, some of this is reflected in the fact that in sort of the earlier days, we were only there for sort of the six weeks. Now we're there for eight weeks. We're capturing more of the... The, the start and the end of what we're seeing. As I said, I alluded to um, the fact that there's only certain areas where we will find our, our seal pups. So their sort of favourite areas are, are sort of this south area down here and then up sort of round Cow and um, the dock area and up around there, which is lovely. But of course, this coastline down on the east coast here and on the west coast is very, very rocky and actually not very favourable at all. We don't really get many adults hauling up there at all either. It's not even a haul out site. But what we're finding as time's going on is that actually some of the less favourable sites are being used. And that's probably a reflection of the fact that they're having to overspill into the maybe less favourable areas be because of the fact that there's a few more seals around. So you can see this from this uh, graph here um, that um, the two SEAL volunteers sent me um, yesterday. So you can see it, the dark grey there is total pups for this year. Um, and then the, the lighter grey is the previous year average. And the, the random lettering at the bottom is the, the codes for the different areas. So you can see it's fairly consistent pattern in terms of the puddle, which was that south area, is still really popular and, um, and other areas like that. And we're finding that a few more places are increasing or decreasing. So um, Bay Fine, which isn't an ideal spot, seems to be fairly consistent with, with numbers. Um, and uh, Smuggler's Cave, again, consistent with, with the numbers. Again, there's limited space and sites. Once we get the bad weather, they need sort of areas to be able to haul up out of the storms and the high tides and stuff. So they are quite site specific um, to where they can and can't. <coughs> so we monitor the pups being born, but we also monitor them through their developmental stages. So this is the five stage process they go through from being completely dependent on mum as a stage one to being completely weaned with their own unique spot pattern. Um, seals have unique spot patterns like we do fingerprints. Um, and then they're left to fend for themselves. So basically the aim is for mum to fatten them up as quickly as possible. So when she leaves, they're nice and fat and they've got lots of reserves so that they can learn to hunt and fend for themselves. So that's why at this time of year, sometimes you'll see some very, very skinny little juvenile seals haul up. That's because they haven't quite got the hang of how to feed themselves yet. And if we have really good weather conditions, we'll find that um, it can take 18 to 25 days here for them to reach stage five. That will happen much more quickly if... Um, if the um, conditions are good, if we don't have too much stormy conditions and things like that. So we've seen it within sort of 18, 20 days that that will happen. Um, they start off as little pups like this, a bit like newborn babies, completely incapable of really moving or doing anything. And they haven't got the muscle strength, so they can't really lift their heads up and they just kind of lie there and look a bit pathetic, really. A um, few days later, they get to stage two. This is where they can start to hold their heads up, look around. They start to fill out a little bit um, and they lose that yellow tinge to their fur. The amniotic fluid um, makes the fur go yellow. It's normally white. Um, for stage three, they basically just get really fat. They lose their neck and become like these little fat barrage balloons that waddle around. As you can see from the, the bigger image here, this is a stage three. Stage four, again, they're still piling on the weight. 
Mother's milk is about 50% fat, so it's like the worst diet you could ever imagine. Um, and they put on a couple of kilos a day and they'll start to lose their white fur. So you can see there's bits of the, the fur pattern coming in there. And then by stage five, they're completely weaned and have their unique spot pattern. Um, so they're the stages that we go through and we like to monitor them through those stages. Um, and obviously we look at the mortality. So we have a range of, um, in terms of mortality each year, it ranges from about zero to oh, 11%. So this year, I think we had about 6% in mortality, which equates to about four individuals this year. One was a stillborn, and we've been seeing this for the last couple of years that stillborns are showing up that we hadn't seen in the earlier surveys. So there might be something going on there. Um, and also we lose a lot. Um, that sort of go missing. We don't know why, where they go. Sometimes they move to another beach, another location, or they're swept out to sea completely and we never see them again. Um, and it's very difficult to know where they go. And once they start getting to a stage four or five, they are quite naughty. Then they do like to move around and make our lives very difficult trying to identify them. Um, so sometimes once, as soon as they get to a stage four, you don't see them reach stage five because they've swum off and gone looking elsewhere. So it can make it very, very difficult to find them. Um, but mortality links very much with stormy weather. If we have really bad storms, we can have really bad mortality. Um, seal pups, surprisingly, um, our grey seal pups are not good swimmers. When they're first born and when they're first um, sort of looking after themselves, they're actually not very good, particularly in the really stormy conditions, um, which is why we find them hauled up this time of year on really public beaches like Port Erin and places like that, because they're just absolutely exhausted and haul up at the nearest beach they can possibly find. Um, so stormy weather, but also um, disease and things like that. We've, we've got um, a seal currently um, uh, at the seal rehab place that's got a equivalent of a really snotty cold and a bad eye infection. So there can be reasons um, disease can be linked with that. But like I said, the stillbirths are something we're still trying to understand. It's something that's been happening more recently. So trying to find out the causes for that um, are something that we still need to work on. I alluded to site fidelity before with the map of where the pups are being, being born. Um, through the photo ID work that we've been doing, we know that um, many of the females that we're seeing are the same females that come back year after year on a, a consistent basis. Some of them, about 50% are the same females we see year on year. And quite often we will find that the female that pupped in the puddle last year will pup in the puddle again this year. So they tend to have their preferences in terms of beach locations as well. They will stick to where they pupped previously. Where this seems to change is if they've lost a pup for any reason. Um, for example, if there was one that was born in the puddle and they lost its pup, the following year they'll actually move to a different beach. So it suggests that maybe they've been put off by staying there, so they go somewhere else. But um, generally they're very specific. We also get new individuals that arrive on a, um, every year. And we think some of this is our, our juveniles that have now reached sexual maturity and have now come back to where they were born to, to have their own pups. And also we think um, it's linked with um, just general movements of, of seals within the wider Irish Sea. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's quite interesting that they will return to the same beaches. And you tend to get the same males coming back as well, which is quite interesting too. Obviously, the volunteers um, spend huge amounts of time sitting on cliffs watching um, the seals. So not only are they there sort of following them through their stages, but they get to experience a lot of the natural behaviour. And in our early surveys, when we had less of a big catalogue of seals, we spent a lot of time monitoring behaviour. And we looked at the, the behaviour of, of seals generally and making sure we weren't having an impact on them. They are protected species and we do have a licence from DEFA to do this work. But obviously we don't want to be having an impact on them um, and, and potentially reducing the survivability of the seal pups um, in, in, through disturbance and things like that. Um, and also sort of how well the mums were doing and whether they were spent, how much time they were spending with the pups. And we were finding it very hugely between the different individuals. Obviously new mums didn't really know what they were doing and they were still sort of finding their feet and weren't particularly brilliant mums. Um, and then the old hats who'd been there several years were 
I mean, brilliant. They stuck really close to the pup for long periods of time, didn't really leave them at all, weren't put off by our presence, things like that. So it was quite interesting. But more recently, we've been finding um, in the last couple of years, aloe suckling. So in normal conditions, a female grey seal will have one pup a year and that's, that's it. Um, but what we've seen um, in the last couple of years is actually that for whatever reason, she, um, this individual, this is her actual pup here. This was, I think, Vimto, I think. And Vimto had a feed and then moved off. And then this is Vans. We, we named them based on letters of the alphabet each year. So last year it was V. Um, so Vans then came in and suckled from this other female that wasn't its mother. And we have no idea what the benefits of this are. Possibly if Vans had lost its mum, then it's the only way it's going to get fed. But um, there's, there's no real benefit to the mum pup here to be sharing the milk with somebody else. So quite an interesting thing. And it's only something we've seen recently. So it'll be something to watch for. I don't think they saw it this year, actually. No, we had one that, that one pup that was feeding off two females. Yes, yeah. And the other behaviour um, that we've seen this year that's been interesting is, as I said, they go through the five developmental stages um, and they have to reach stage five and then they're weaned and they're left to fend for themselves. But this year we had about three individuals um, where mum left the pups before they were completely weaned. So they left them at about stage three to four. So fairly well into the development. We reckon they, they left about after 15 days. So mum would normally have hung around for another sort of five or so days. Um, and there was, there was one in particular in South Harbour, um, Waldo, who, whose mum left him. He was very fat when she left. So um, he certainly didn't suffer, but um, hung round for ages and, and ages in South Harbour. So whenever he'd go over and visit, he'd, he'd sort of come and say hello and see what you're all doing. Um, but yeah, so that's something new again that we've, we've not really seen before, is the, that some of the mums are, are leaving the pups earlier than they would normally. Um, usually what happens is once they're weaned, the, the, the males that are hanging around in, in that area, they are, the male will have a harem of ladies in, in an area. So, for example, South Harbour. So as soon as she's left the pup to its own devices, that's when he makes his move. Um, so maybe the females were feeling a bit more frisky earlier this year. Don't know, but it's interesting behaviour. So I touched on the photo ID work. As I said, um, seals have a unique spot pattern. So part of the work that we do is we build up this catalogue of individuals and we photograph the left and right sides of the head and neck area. Um, and we use that to identify the individuals. That's how we know which mums have come back year after year, which ones are new, that they've got the site fidelity in terms of location, but also coming back to the calf. Um, and it's been really, really useful information and we, we get to build up a picture of the, the individuals, um, which has been, been really nice and given us a lot of useful information about them and enabled us to realise we've got something like 400 individuals in the catalogue now. So what started off as a very small catalogue grows and grows every year. We, it varies from year to year, the new individuals, um, but it can be sort of 20, 30, 50 new individuals that we pick up each year. So it's, it's really nice to see. Aaron mentioned this with the birds that over the five decades, they've all started coming back a week earlier every 10 years. Well, this was something we, we looked at um, more closely this year. So the numbers here are the numbers that are given to the, the adult seals. So in this case, it will be females. So this column here is the date that the pups that they had were born on. And then the previous year, um, the date of the pup. So the difference in however many days. So obviously this was three days earlier this year. So we're finding more and more with our, with our pups um, being born that it's earlier and earlier each year, which is why we're trying to get to the start, arriving at the season before they arrive. So the last two years, we started a week or so earlier than normal and we still miss it every time. We think we've just about caught it and this year we thought we, we'd sorted it. And um, Molly, one of the uh, assistant wardens, the day we arrived, said, oh, there's a pup literally just been born and we hadn't seen any. And we were like, oh, brilliant. We've literally arrived the day the first pup was born. Brilliant. And we went out the next day and there was like a stage two. And we were like, oh, missed it. 
So there's research that's come out of Swansea University and we've been, um, we've been sharing our data with them that they seem to think that climate change is the reason why the season is um, starting earlier. They also think it's extending later, but because the calf shuts um, early in, like in the season, we don't know if that's the case. So it's something to look into, but they've, Swansea have been looking at data through the wider Irish Sea and they're definitely seeing the, the seasons extending at the start and the end. So something to, to follow through on. Um, the other thing that we found out over the last few years, which I find amazing, is we, we knew that seals were quite mobile and that they, they um, moved around the Isle of Man quite a lot. Um, and, and the Irish Sea and through sa some satellite tag work that was done um, by St Andrews University where they glue a, a satellite tag onto the back of the, the head of the seals. It, it comes off when they molt so it, it doesn't cause any harm or anything like that and it's probably about the size of a cigarette packet. Um, they tagged some seals uh, in Strangford Lock here and what looks like a three-year-old scribble is actually seal movements. So there was one that obviously was off the north here feeding and then we've got one that was coming backwards and forwards to the calf on a regular basis. So this was from a few years ago and it was the first indication to us that our Manx seals may, may not be Manx. So with further work and communication again with um, St Andrews, um, they sent us some pictures. They were tagging um, seals down in the de estuary and they knew that it wasn't a popping location because basically when the high the water comes in and high water there's nowhere for the seals to really haul up and, and have pops so they sent us um pictures of the headshots before they um of the the tagged individuals and we compared it to our catalogue and we found a match and this is the gps um tag um movements of this seal and you can see you can just see the tag on the back of the head there, the GPS unit. And that was a picture we took of that individual on the calf the year she had a pup. So we've made a link with, with the de estuary there. So we know that the, our Manx seals go, go to the D as well. But the best one that was a few years ago was the discovery that our Isle of Man seal, who is 079 to us, is actually Tulip Bell down in Cornwall. And Tulip Bell has been moving between the Isle of Man and Cornwall quite regularly for a very, very long time. So that was really nice to see. And Tulip Bell has popped on the calf for several years as well. So seeing that huge, huge range of movements, quite massive really. Um, and it was, it was really nice to see that. So again, this was done through photo ID comparisons. So you can see this dark sort of blob here is quite big, ties in with that one there. And then you've got that sort of two there which is those there and you've got two blobs there which tie in and this is all done by eye the photo catalogue we don't have a fancy computer that kind of lines them all up and you know gives you an answer this is all done by eye all of our photo id work and then when we sent our catalogue to um sue down in the cornwall um seal research group she's got a band of volunteers who do it all by eye as well um, so it, you can imagine it's very, very time consuming. And I, I, I get excited because we have like 400 individuals in our catalogue. Yeah, mm -hmm. they've got like 10,000 plus. So um, you can imagine it's really, really time consuming. There is some software um, that is used by St Andrews and Natural Resources and uh, Wales and things like that. And we have been in conversations about trying to link in with that that software package and that database, which is like 100,000 individuals. Um, but you have to have photographed them in a certain way for it to then be uploaded into the system. And apparently it takes half an hour per individual to, to do the comparison and load it up. So for us, it's quicker by eye at the moment. So one day maybe, they're talking about upgrading their system as well. So, um, yeah, this is one of our little seals down at South a, a few years ago. So it's shown us a lot of work. The monitoring that we've done has shown a lot of information. We know a lot about the seals coming back year after year. The, you know, the number of pups are fairly stable now and things like that. Really useful information. But it's also there's lots more questions. I keep going on Manx seals. Well, we only monitor them in the autumn. So we 
don't know where they go the rest of the time. Do they stay at the calf? Do they move around? Is it just the, the juveniles that are moving um, around, sort of looking around? Do our adults tend to stay? We just have no idea. We don't really know where they're going to feed and forage. So in terms of um, future marine nature reserve designations, if we know that our seals forage off, off Douglas, for example, then we might want to protect that area as a new marine nature reserve to ensure that their feeding ground is protected. We just don't know. It, we've, we've answered a lot of questions, but we've also created an awful lot more um, that hopefully one day we'll be able to answer. In an ideal world, I'd like to get some satellite tags um, and we'd have to get the, the, the group from St Andrews to come over and do that. But it has to be a scientifically robust number of tags to make it, it worthwhile. Um, and at £5,000 a tag, I need about 100 grand. So it might be a little while before we do that. But I'll go back to birds now and um, keep, keep Aaron happy. <laughs> so here's a couple of the decoys. I love birds um, over, on the, over on the calf at Keone Halby. So I'm sure many of you know the project has been ongoing since 2016. Um, and the aim is to get puffins to come back to the calf to breed. They bred there once. Um, I think they were last seen breeding in the 80s and haven't bred there since. So sort of bunny hopped off the back of the um, long tail eradication programme and the work that was being done for the shearwaters. Puffins are obviously ground nesting birds as well. So it was a perfect opportunity to see if we could get them to come back. Um, obviously they are red listed. Um, obviously even on the uh, Manx bird life, uh, birds of conservation concern, they're red listed locally as well as um, wider. So their numbers have been declining rapidly um, and we can see that around the whole of the Isle of Man as well, not just on the calf. So, um, and who doesn't love a puffin? Who doesn't love a puffin? So um, we started the project, very dignified. Um, we ordered a hundred decoy puffins. So these are made by the same people who make your garden gnomes. So I got in touch with the garden centre who, who were making these and I said, can I have a hundred please? They nearly fell off their chairs. So we ordered our hundred puffins and then of course we needed some way of anchoring them onto the, the cliff faces. So um, we drilled holes in their bottoms, hence why they're all upside down and put metal spikes into them. So a bit undignified. Um, and we also have a speaker system that Manx Ornithological Society very kindly funded. And it um, basically, because they're, they like to nest in colonies, we needed the decoys to act as fake colonies. And the speaker system then draws the birds in from out at sea. Um, I'm sure their eyesight's reasonably good, but I'm not sure they'd see tiny little decoys on a cliff two kilometres away. So the speaker system helps. So Keone Holby down here is um, one of the historic sites where puffins used to nest. So that's where the speaker system and 50 of the puffins are. And then the others are over by the lighthouse over here. Again, it's another historic site. So the sites were chosen based on the knowledge that we had of, 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 of where they'd been historically. And uh, here's a couple of the decoys at Keone Holby and, and the speaker system, which apparently the rabbits really love to chew the cables. Um, so every year it, it comes off and it's currently with um, our colleague Dawn's husband, who's an electrician, who is now armour plating all of the cabling for me for next year. So we also have two camera traps that we put out. Um, obviously, I'd love to be able to go and sit on the car for the whole um, puffin breeding season and just see what's going on. I'm not sure Lee would let me do that. So we have to install camera traps instead. So we have... Um, one at Keone Holby and one over by the lighthouses. Um, so what was really nice this year, um, this is the lighthouse camera trap and um, this is one of the buzzards flying past, <laughs> which was really nice to see. But we pick up all sorts of things. So obviously Lockton's love a good selfie. Didn't know that until we put the camera traps out. They don't like the decoys. They like to run into them and obliterate them. Uh, rabbits, we've had curlews. Um, I think one year we had a mistaken puffin that turned out to be, was it like a pied wagtail or something like that? I don't know, these, these bird wardens. Um, and obviously people, people love to go and check them out. So we've got some lovely selfie images. So I should probably put up some CCT camera notices so people know, but yeah, lots of legs walking around, which is really nice. And we made the mistake one year of having the camera angled at the wrong position. So it kept picking up the tide. 
So there was just pictures of, of changing waves with nothing. So we learned after the first year. Um, yeah, these are our, our loved birds down at Keone Halby. Um, and actually, because they're decoys, all, all, they're just pre preformed all of they all face the same way so the MNH technicians very kindly cut one of their heads off and glued it back on a different way so they could look at each other so we've got our little love birds on the rock there so we'd been trying um, obviously for a few years to get them to come back and we hadn't had huge success we'd seen higher numbers sort of in the waters around the calf and the wardens had reported such sort of a lot of activity seen at the bottom of the lighthouses and things like that so we were all like oh you know it's happening and then this year really really pleased to say um one of the kayakers was out and about and snapped a um a puffin snuggling up to one of our decoys mm -hmm. and because i saw this one first and i was like I, I don't what and then i had a closer look and then i saw the second image and i was like so we got very excited there was much squealing in the office and um, this is the first time we'd actually seen puffins confirmed landing on the calf for for about 30 years so it was very excited very excited um so we sent rob out to go and investigate to see what was going on obviously we wanted to do it from a safe distance we didn't want to deter them or anything luckily rob has a massive lens for his camera and the following day he went out and he managed to capture this which was um, a puffin with nest material in its mouth which would suggest nesting so again even more squealing in the office ensued and, and much excitement so it was the first year that we actually got to say that you know there was an attempt at breeding and um, off the coast of Keone Halby, puffins were seen on a daily basis hanging out there, um, which was really nice to see and was great. If you came, if you came over to the car from the Port St Mary side and you went down the, that coast, you'd pretty much guarantee you'd see the puffins sat there, which was, which was really nice. Sad to say, they didn't, we didn't think they were successful, um, but it just shows that they're thinking about it and hopefully next year, along with our buzzards, we can add them to breeding species on the calf for next year, um, which would be really nice. And if not, Aaron and I are going to smuggle some in from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so I will end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if anyone's got questions for either of us. Question from Lara. Um, the times up on the point of error, I've seen quite a few seals actually hauled out on the, uh, the beach and shingle up there. Yeah. Is that weather driven or is that another? Um, they, it's, it's something that's been occurring more recently. The last few years we've seen actually really quite large numbers, up to 90 have been hauled up there, whereas before they haven't. So it's possibly that they've been displaced from somewhere else, maybe through disturbance, or actually that maybe the numbers are, are bolstering a bit and they're overspilling into new areas. So that's quite possible. And we know that that sort of northwest coast and around there is, is really good feeding because obviously there's a lot of seabirds up there and often you'll see cetaceans and things. So there's plenty of food for them to feed on. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, the question's about Aaron initially, please. Uh, for me, this is a totally new experience, and I suspect nearly everybody in the room will know the answer to this. But the first shots that you were showing uh, various birds, Aaron, I, um, I quickly realised that you were actually holding them between your fingers. So that was presumably preceded by some kind of trapping, trapping netting? Yes, yeah, so uh, on the calf we catch birds on a sort of a daily basis, providing the weather is okay, using uh, what we call mist nets. Uh, mist nets are very fine uh, um, sort of nylon netting, which is strung between two poles, usually placed in front of um, vegetation. So the birds are moving through, uh, they don't see the, the net, and then they get caught in the net. And then we go around and extract those birds, and we bring them back to the observatory um, where we age and sex the bird. Uh, we put a ring on the leg if it hasn't already got a ring, um, and we take various measurements so that we can sort of gauge um, you know, how healthy the bird is. Uh, we then weigh it and then release it and it's on its way again. Uh, so uh, Another question for the two of you, if I may. Um, Laura sort of mentioned uh, reference Swansea earlier on, um, but I wasn't quite sure if you both sort of, at, um, uh, sort of coordinate or send your data into a central database 
a national database? Is there a national database for all the work you do, or is it purely individual sections that do meet up at some time? Well, just for those on Zoom, I, I forgot I should repeat the question. So we're being asked about what we do with our data and what, what um, databases it go in, local, national or otherwise. Do you want to start with birds? <laughs> with birds. <laughs> um, it's a very complicated answer. It, it, it varies depending on uh, a little bit what we're doing. So we, we, we tend to send most of our data through national databases, but they vary depending whether we're ringing the bird, whether we're just seeing the bird. So, it, yeah, it varies, but it generally is a national database. Um, in terms of our seals, it's more local. So uh, historically, there is a, a software package called Re Recorder 6, and various um, environmental groups feed their data into that. So um, ourselves, Manx National Heritage, um, the Bat Group, Fungus Group, all sorts of different groups feed into that. But more recently, we've upgraded to some extent to the NBN Atlas, which is a national database. We have our, our own Manx sort of fronts as well, but it feeds into a national database. So a lot of the seal data and records and things feed in, into that. So it's more local. But obviously, Swansea had got in touch and asked about our seal data specifically. So we were more than happy to, to share that and, and include our data in the wider research that's ongoing because quite often we kind of just end up being excluded so it's nice to be able to be part of the the bigger picture um, and see how our populations change and differ from from other areas so in terms of for example um our pups i know i talked about that they're they're, they're being born that little bit earlier but depending on where you are in the country depends on what time they're, of year they're born so it sort of shifts as you go up through the 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 British Isles, so again, quite interesting to see where we all fit in with that. So, mm -hmm. but it all seems to link in with the environment, doesn't it? So, I suppose I thought there was some wider interest. So yeah. Thanks, Ray, go on. One for Aaron. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh no, you're all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, go on, ladies first. Um, there's a question from Zoom. Um, are there any general patterns being identified in relation to the bird health over recent decades? But, well, bird health, although, although we, when we're catching birds, we would sort of monitor um, their general health by we look at their, the amount of fat that a bird is, is carrying. Um, we also weigh the birds. So, so we get a sort of a, a general picture. But uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's something we don't really see um, a, a great deal of, of problem with, with bird health. It's not something that we see uh, lots of, you know, we don't see lots of, lots of dead or dying birds around. So... Um, generally, birds are healthy when they're moving through. Yes. Uh, st uh, staying with migration, I was intrigued to see the large number of wood pigeons that you were recording mm. on migration. I, I didn't realise that they were a migratory species, but where do you think they were going and, and why are they <laughs> leaving the area? Mm. Okay, so this is a question about uh, migrating wood pigeons. Um, it's actually a that there are some really big numbers that move through this this particular autumn um so you know we were dealing with two 250 uh, birds there was actually um, a site in the uk that dealt with 199,000 wood pigeons in one day um so moving through there so so we've got very small numbers compared to, <laughs> to some places um there's probably some local movements very much going on but yeah, there's also birds moving through to the continent. So this is one of the things that we don't... You know, when, when we see a robin in our garden, we think, oh, you know, it's in our garden all year round. Well, it, it probably isn't. Or it definitely isn't. It will be a different robin that you'll see. There's probably half a dozen to start with. But you know, their populations will move at different times of the year. So you know, the robin that's in your garden in Christmas probably won't be there in the summer. It will be a different one. And the same with wood pigeons. They'll be moving through. Uh, you know, they'll be going south. Uh, for the winter, so those that are breeding in the top, you know, in Scandinavia, will be coming down south for winter. But those in the middle will go even further south, and then it will shift up and down. Interesting. Thank you. I've got a question for Aaron, please, about the sheer waters and um, the recordings that you play them. Did you? Did I understand that the male and female re replies are different? Yes, yeah, so this is a question about the, the different types of calls from, from Manx shearwaters. Um, and they are, yeah, the, 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 the males and the females have a different type of call. So, 
So when we play the call, we actually play a duet call, which has got the male and the female call on it. Um, and then that will hopefully elicit a response from either the male or the female that are in the burrow. So they don't normally, they're not normally in the burrow together, although sometimes they are. Um, but with shearwaters, um, what they do is that they, one bird will go out and feed and it will be at sea for five or six days. And then it will come back ashore and it will take over from the bird that's been sitting on the egg for five or six days. And that bird gets its opportunity to go out and feed whilst the other one stays at home and looks after the egg and continues to incubate it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the different sexes call in a different way. So that's one of the reasons why we'll, we identify that is then we can sort of work out how many birds we've got and whether it's predominantly the male or the female that are doing the incubating. Yes. I was amazed by your photograph of, of the 40 buzzards sort of over mm. Fantastic. Are you aware of buzzards breeding on the island now? Okay, so there's a question about buzzards uh, and, and whether they breed on the island. And the easy answer is yes, they do. Um, so it's not something that has, well, it's something that's only occurred in, in sort of relatively recent times. Um, so, but uh, yeah, there are a few pairs that are now breeding. And, uh, you know, I think they've now got a, a, a sort of a foothold on the island and numbers are, are increasing. So, you know, and that's why we saw the flock of 20 that we had. Thank you. Hmm. The red kite is becoming prolific over in the UK. Uh, are you seeing any of those at all? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a question about uh, red kites. And yes, we had one red kite um, in just at the end of September this year. Um, and I think, yeah, there are odd reports from the island from time to time. Um, there was, I think, one at, near Foxdale recently. So, yeah, they, uh, there are species which is occurring with greater frequency on, on the island as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, probably in another 10, 15 years, it may well be that red kites are... Um, sort of being seen here on a regular basis like the buzzards are now. Yeah, another one about buzzards, sorry. Okay. Uh, where do they nest? Because there aren't any uh, trees of any size on the farm. Uh, no, so this is about uh, where, where buzzards breed uh, or actually nest. Um, they're, they're actually very at home on a cliff. Um, yeah, so the, the particular nest here was in a, a nice little rock crevice and they, they built it in a nice overhang so that the nest was very well protected. If the number of buzzards is increasing, what's the likely effect on other bird populations? Are they competing in any way with any other um, so this is a question about a, a sort of, well, I suppose, what buzzards prey on to some degree. Um, I think certainly on the calf, the, the, the majority of their prey items will be rabbits. Um, so they will rely quite heavily on um, sort of roadkill. Um, they'll pick up. Uh, so any, any carrion that's available to them. Um, but they also eat a lot of beetles and, and insects and worms and things like that. So um, I, we don't really see buzzards... Um, trying to take very many birds at all. Um, so I, I don't think they'll have a great effect on bird populations. Other things that eat beetles and insects, like the rooks and the other corvids, are they likely to be impacted by the presence of increasing birds? I, I suppose there's a possibility that that might happen in, in sort of a particular area or something like that, but I think on the, on the whole there's sufficient prey items like that for, to go around. I was going to say, there's plenty of rooks and jackdaws in my <laughs> garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think when, we... When you, said, when you said about all the jackdaws that are passing over, I thought, yes, they're all heading for my garden. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I, I think we don't see that how much life there actually is in some places. And we, when we were um, trying to catch the, that particular buzzard that, that we ended up catching... <laughs> Uh, we, were, we were baiting an area with a rabbit and it kept coming down for the to the rabbit. It wasn't eating the rabbit. What it was eating was um, some beetles that were carrion beetles that were feeding on the rabbit. And, and, you know, and when you moved the rabbit, there was you know, 20, 30 beetles underneath. And, and the buzzard had been there all morning eating, but there was obviously plenty there. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. <coughs> yep. Well, um, not a lot of seals. Not a lot of seals. Um, you said that the 
breeding season has extended, it's got earlier, and it could be climate change. What's the thinking on, what's the trigger for breeding? Is it, is it w wind, or is it food, or is it temperature? Or, and, and if, um, it's presuming it, you said it's happening across the UK, but if it's early in the Isle of Man, is it always early in Scotland? Or is, it a, is that a good comparison tell you something about whether it's weather or temperature or whatever? Okay, so the question is um, linked to seals and, and them starting to breed earlier. So this, this um, the breeding earlier has been seen across the whole of, of the UK. Um, which is why Swansea is so keen to sort of get lots of different data sets from around the British Isles for, for that reason. Um, and breeding is, is often linked with um, food availability and, and, and things like that, because you think, why would you breed in the autumn and winter with all these storms? But that's basically when all of the juvenile fish have, have grown up and got bigger, so there's lots of food around at this time of year. That's why we see the minke whales off Marine Drive, because all of the shoaling fish come to spawn and so forth. So it's really abundant time of year for food, so it gives the, the females plenty to feed up on. Um, and then obviously for the pups then to subsequently feed on themselves once, they, um, uh, once they're weaned. There probably is some link with, with water temperature as well um, and that kind of thing um, and possibly daylight hours and, and those changes that we sort of see through the autumn. Um, but a lot of it's based around sort of the food, so yeah. But that would be about adult fish then, so you'd link that back to spawning potentially because... Yeah. Yeah. So it's possible that the, the fish are spawning earlier because the sea temperatures are, are warmer earlier in the year and therefore they're getting bigger earlier. So therefore it's bringing that shift. Well, now I'd have to be linked into plankton for food for Yeah, for yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it's all linked because our seals are apex predators. So they're the top of the food chain and obviously they regulate everything and keep it all in balance. So they will be following what's going on within the, the wider food chain and the food web, so yeah. Now, does the extended season also then mean that more females are hauling out to have pups at different times? How does that sort of extend the season? Because it's, you know, the whole period stays the same from what you were saying for each of those stages. But are there more coming out at later times because they know they can get food late. Possibly. So a question about um, the extended period with the seals again. Um, so it, it, there aren't more females hauling up. It, it's just that it's the same number that are spreading out. So um, from one of the slides there, you could see that some of them, have a, a good percentage, are earlier. We're not sure what the end of our season is doing because obviously we're not there to, to be able to observe it. I mean, on some years when we've gone out to the calf in December, we found pups in December, quite young pups, which is, is quite unusual, um, but it's not unheard of. Um, so the, the females are quite good. They have an ability to, um, delay things if they feel that conditions aren't quite right. So they will um, mate with a, a male after they've, they've finished looking after their pups and they'll delay gestation by 100 days roughly before they um, will then grow the pup inside of them. But actually they can change the day slightly as well. If they, they can sense if there's a bad storm coming and they'll hold off um, and things like that. So there's mm. the possibility that maybe some are holding off because there's something better you know, they might sense something. It don't really know, to be honest. And we and we got we got through to about I think thirty five pups having been mm. born this year. Yeah. And then everything stopped, and then we had about five or six days where there wasn't any pups, and, yeah. and the girls were getting really worried that, that, <laughs> that you know they were going to have the worst year on record, and then it all started again. Yeah. So yeah. there was obviously something that the seals didn't like and yeah. decided right. There we're is not, quite not often a, a double peak with, with pup births on the calf. I, I didn't show it, but if you look at the historic records, there's like an early peak and then it sort of drops off and then you get this second peak later on and then it drops off again. So, mm. yeah, so there's obviously something. Ray? Um, what's planned for next year on the calf? Mm. <laughs> so the question is, what's planned for the calf next year? Uh, well, we're going to be ringing um, 
wagtails, aren't we? Yes. With colour rings. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we're going to put. We have a, a, a very good passage of grey wagtails through the Calf of Man, um, particularly in, in autumn. Um, but we know very little about where they're coming from, where they're going to. We, uh, they can't all have bred on the Isle of Man. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we plan to put some colour rings on them. Uh, and hopefully that will increase um, a, any sort of reports that we get. Uh, so we'll learn a bit more about them. Um, the other thing that I'm particularly excited about is uh, a radio tracking uh, program that we're hoping to, to start with wheat ears. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to um, put up a, uh, an automated system called MOTUS, which actually um, tracks birds that have got little antennas on them. Um, and so uh, we don't have to catch the bird, it just has to fly over uh, and we know that it's been there. So um, again, that's something that um, the Wildlife Park uh, have, have sponsored us for, um, for this year. So hopefully that'll be in position ready for next year. So is there an increase between, uh, an increase in eiders <laughs> at the detriment to shags? Um, I, I don't think so, no. I think uh, they both feed on very different things. So eiders will feed on crustaceans mostly, whereas um, shags will feed on flatfish. Um, so they're, they're feeding in very different areas, even though they're both in, in, in the sea. Um, so I don't think there's any competition. There certainly isn't any competition in, in nesting areas. They nest in completely different areas. Uh, I think the shag issue is, is something bigger and wider than just a, a competition with another species. Yes? A question on the lifespan of the different varieties of birds. Um, how does it vary? And is there any feeling as what influences lifespan of the different mm -hmm. birds? Okay, so this is a question about uh, different lifespan in, in different species. Um, so if we want to take a, perhaps a couple of, of real sort of poles of difference, we've talked a lot about Manx shearwaters. Uh, Manx shearwaters are probably the, the oldest British bird, um, so they can live over 50 years. Um, as, a, as a species, though, they don't usually breed until they're five or six years old. So uh, there's a lot of time invested in getting to that point of being able to breed. And then they can only uh, lay one egg at a time. So you know, if, if that egg, for whatever reason, fails, it's got to go a whole another year before it can try and breed again. So, um, and, and that probably influences how long the bird can live because you know, it's got to, uh, to e just keep the population stable. It's got to have at least a couple of, uh, of successful breeding seasons. And it's not always going to have a successful breeding season every year. So, yeah, that very much influences how, how long a bird lives. Um, whereas if you go to the other end of the scale, you know, something like a goldcrest, um, Britain's tiniest or smallest bird, um, we get a big population of goldcrests moving through the calf. Um, they only weigh around about five and a half grams, yet they migrate very long distances. Um, but they can have several broods in a year and they'll raise uh, a lot of young in one brood. So you know, they, they probably achieve that aim almost in one year. Um, and many goldcrests won't last more than 12 months. You know, so they'll get around to breeding, they'll raise some young, and they may then die on their next migration. If they're lucky, they might get two or three years. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, until recently, I thought the shag and the cormorant were the same bird, but learned they are actually two different birds. And you don't mention cormorants at all. Okay, so there's a question about sh shags and cormorants. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they sort of, uh, I suppose, occupy a niche almost together, but they are different species. So, yeah, they will feed on, on slightly different things, uh, and their requirements for nesting are different. So shags will generally nest in, in holes and crevices and caves, whereas cormorants will nest on the top of a cliff. So they're not competing with each other um, for food source or, or really for, for nesting locations. And your records don't mention cormorants. I could see. No, well, cormorant is, uh, was a species that bred on the calf in the late 60s, um, but it hasn't bred there for a long time. Um, they do occur around the calf still. Um, so we have a population of probably somewhere around about 10 individuals that we see around the calf regularly. It's probably a lot more than 10, but yeah. that's the sort of number we see. Um, it is something that I have planned for next year. We've actually 
uh, encompassing some willow this year, we've actually built some willow baskets uh, and we're, we're trying to work out a way of fastening them to a rock. Um, so we've got a couple of sites which are sort of favoured haul out sites for cormorants and one of them in particular looks an ideal place for them to nest. So we're hoping that by putting some willow baskets there, we'll just give them that little bit of impetus to, to say, yep, this is the place that we want to nest at. So maybe we'll get them breeding in future years. Thank you. Ray? Um, any evidence of great suker nesting? Great skewer. Yep. yep. So a <laughs> question about great skewers <laughs> nesting. <laughs> um, they haven't actually bred as yet, but we've had uh, one particular skewer. We think it's the same bird returning for the last five years. So this was its fifth year on the calf. Um, for the last two years, it's been accompanied by another skewer. So, so we've had two around for the last couple of years. Um, and then in July this year, we had a third and a fourth one turn up. So um, they are becoming more and more frequent as a, a summer visitor to the calf. And yeah, if I was a betting man, I would say there is a good chance that in the next few years, the skewers will, will breed. Um, as a species, they have moved south uh, as, a, as a breeding species. Uh, used to breed just up in the, the, the Scottish islands, but um, Rathlin Island in, in, in Ireland, uh, which is on the same latitude as the calf, um, and now has, breed, or has had breeding skewers for the last 10 years. So, so yeah, there's a very good chance. Yes? Do you ever see the same individual birds you've winged coming back? Yeah, so this is a question about uh, sort of returning birds. Um, yeah, so one of the, the I suppose, the, the beauties of being able to ring a bird is that you can then identify it again and you know which individual it is. And, and yes, we do get birds coming back that are migratory birds. So, you know, I've caught willow warblers uh, and gold crests and things like that, which I've ringed one year and then caught them the next year. And as I said with the blue tit, I've caught them on exactly the same date the following year. Uh, and in fact, it, uh, not on the calf, but in a place I used to work at um, before in Kent, we had a little reed bed and I had two sedge warblers that we ringed one year and they were caught in that net by that bush. And the following year we caught the same two reed, uh, uh, sedge warblers in that net by that bush. So yeah, they're very, very, very good at finding their way back. Okay, if there's no more questions then, we'll uh, bring the evening to a close. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks.